somebody I'm in the right place tonight I'm in the right place amen no my GPS didn't take me to the wrong place it, it it led me right to the right place amen you may be seated for a moment glory be to God everyone said exodus, exodus. oh come on say exodus, exodus. amen uh, exodus has has been a conference of ours that we have uh, that has evolved into something beyond us. Uh, and at first, we launched Exodus back in 2015, I believe was our first Exodus. And we launched that with the thought of, of leaving Mina Street because we continued to grow and then we deflated and grow and then filled up the building and deflated again. And for... And, uh, a lot of reasons, you know, the the old the old uh, uh, rule on that is that you cannot grow fish larger than the bowl. Amen. If you have a small bowl, you're not you're not going to be able to fill it up. And so we had gone through that for for uh, you know a couple two or three years, probably even longer than that. And and so we made the decision. You know, we just need to leave leave uh, uh, this this small auditorium, which which we were. I believe we were in there tight at 110, 120 people. I mean, I'm talking about every chair filled, even on a platform. Amen. And uh, so we left there, and, and you know the story. We went from there to uh, Mill Street. In Mill Street, we were, we were there at the Lutheran Church for a couple of years, and we had another two exoduses there. And then, and, and then we went from there to uh, the PC building right there on Whittier Boulevard, and we had two more ex, uh, Exodus conferences there. Then we came here, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And, and uh, we have had uh, one, two uh, Exoduses here as well. And, and last year would have been our seventh, uh, or yeah, last year in 2020, but we didn't have last year because the old reason as to when you make a phone call and you call a business up and say, well, because of COVID, <laughs> and and that's why we didn't have Exodus last year. We were we were right. I mean, we had done everything that we needed to do. We were prepared. We were a week right before we were going to start Exodus in 2020, and uh, we got the word from the prophet. We had put our 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 trust in in, in the word from the prophet, and and he said it's probably not good to do it this year, and so we pro postponed it till this past year which or this past march and boy was it a powerful service amen? amen or 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 not service but series of meetings my word i mean it was just off the hook uh, uh it was over the top and if there's any other words i can say to that that's what it was every every uh um 
compliment and and uh, thing that was said regarding Exodus, and not just I'm not talking about me, but from other ministry, other people that attended our past Exodus meeting, uh, they they were they were overwhelmed by the power, the anointing, and the ministry of of Exodus. It has, uh, and the reason I, I say uh, it has grown beyond us is because at Mina Street, we started with a couple of speakers, uh, which were Brother Emery and Brother Joseph Gomez, if you remember. Those were our first Exodus speakers. And, and, uh, and as we continued to go and grow, um, the speaker list got larger and the burden got larger not knowing that God was doing something. God was doing something within us as well as the region. It, it got to the point to where every, it seemed like everywhere we went, it was outgrowing. Every sanctuary we went to, it outgrew. We went, when we went to the Lutheran church that was able to hold 250 people, well, it outgrew it. When we went to the PC church, it was it was a bit larger, and we all grew that. We had to go to the Ritz Garden. Remember, we went to that banquet room during that uh, those years, and then uh, we went to uh, the Holiday Inn banquet room there. Remember that? We all grew that. We can't have another Exodus there. We just we just we won't, we won't fit. Uh, we, and, and last year or this past March, we went to Brother uh, Coopley's church, and and uh, it, it, it's just not big enough, not big enough. Amen. And uh, it's, we don't have a church in a, a UPC church in this part of Los Angeles or Orange County that will house us, that will house Exodus. I should say, not us, but Exodus. And the reason I say it is all grown us because it's not a conference that is made just for Word of Flame Ministries. God has grown this conference to minister to the region. The region. People have people come from all over California. Last year people came from from Arizona as well, Texas, the East Coast. Alaska, 60 people from Alaska came to Exodus. You know, um, people. Uh, I think we had somebody from Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, and 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 uh, people were watching from all over uh, as we were streaming. Uh, I don't know what God is doing with Exodus exactly. I just know that that the Lord has put us on this trail and and I and, and, and in prayer I, I told the Lord I said God as long as you provide for it I'll continue to do it as long as you continue to help and 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 do what you're doing then then I'm going to continue to do it. I'm not going to force. I'm not, I, I, I am not going to uh, do anything that you don't want to do. And my prayer many years ago, as I continued to pray it, is that, Lord, whatever you're doing, I want to be right in the middle of it. That was before I even came to L.A., and lo and behold, God sent us to Los Angeles. Hallelujah. Amen. I, 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 Brother Costa, I was fine in the Central Coast. Amen. My wife and I, when we first got married, came to Los Angeles and, and stayed up here about a year in 1980 and then went back home and said, never again. I'm never going back to L.A. <laughs> I'm never going back. And then in 1997, God gave us the call. And here we, here we are. And, and here you are. Praise God. Amen. And I, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that God called us back to Los Angeles, a place that, I, that we, 
that, that we pledged each other that we would never do. But we did it because we answered God's call. And because of that, God has blessed you and he has blessed me. Amen. And I love L.A. I love L.A. Amen. Now, if you were to ask me, why don't you move back back to the Central Coast, I'd go, nope. I, I, I am where I need to be. Amen. I am in the place of my anointing. I am in the place of my calling. I am in the place, amen, where I'm most happy. Amen. And what makes you so happy? Uh, what makes me so happy is, is that when I see you and others, new ones, amen, get filled with the Holy Ghost, be baptized in Jesus' name, and live for God. Hallelujah. Amen. Because then I know I'm fulfilling the will of God in my life. About, uh, I, I have no other purpose and reason to live. I love my grandchildren. I love my children. And, and of course, that's a good reason to live. But that's not the main reason. Amen. The main reason is to live for God. It's to live for God. Amen. And, 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 I, and I want to take all those to heaven. Amen. Along with my family and your families. And we're going to get there in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you love the Lord tonight? You love the Lord tonight. And so this past Exodus, if you remember, I don't know if you got there early. If you did, uh, there was a long line to get inside. And, and when we came in with the speakers, they said, we had never seen that before. The line went all the way down the block. Amen. To get, in, to get into the building. And, and the power of God moved. And, and the grace of God moved. From the very beginning with, with uh, Brother Winslow, he, he, he got behind that pulpit and he took the conference from here phew, and he took it out there. Amen. And, and it just hovered there throughout the conference. People were blessed. People were healed. People were delivered. People received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Words of wisdom and knowledge and uh, prophetic utterances were given. And I thank the Lord that uh, for the seasoned men of God that ministered at this past exodus. Well, I, I want to tell you that all of them, all of them have, have confirmed to be at our exodus 2022 already they've all confirmed glory to god glory to god and i just want to tell you something where the flame is that is that when ministers bring their whole family to a conference that says something that says something amen uh, uh brother winslow brought his grandchildren amen his grandsons to the conference amen and uh uh, all the way from Texas, Brother Dross brought his children. I didn't say they're not children, they're a young lady and a young man, amen, that are in ministry. And he brought them, he brought them along with his wife to the conference. And when ministers begin to do that, uh, it says something. It says that they like the conference they, to the point to where they want to share it with their family and they want their family to enjoy the presence the power the anointing of a, a particular conference that they attend and are a part of amen and these are men that are they, they go to conferences almost every weekend they're booked amen i talked to brother garcia the other day he says he says brother garcia i am booked amen for the entire year amen until exodus I said, all right but uh, he did not have Monday booked. <laughs> so I said, I need you to come in. And so he's coming in, amen, on, 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 on Monday morning and leaving Tuesday morning. Same thing with Brother Winslow. He'll be with us in a couple of weeks. And he'll be coming in, amen, in, in, in the morning prior or, or that morning and then leaving early the very next morning because he, he's booked in other places. I'm telling you. Uh, that these men of God, they, they love the power of the anointing. 
of the Lord that they feel when they come to Exodus. Don't you? Have you been blessed? Have you grown? Amen. Has God ministered to you? Has God done something in your life? Hallelujah. Amen. And, and he has done these things. Uh, and, and just to ad lib a, a letter, a letter uh, that Sister Buxton wrote. Now, you may not know who Sister Buxton is. Sister Buxton is, is a, a minister's wife, or she's a widow now. Uh, of an elder that was in our constituency uh, here in in uh, Southern California, built a great church in Ontario, and and then went on to meet the Lord. And Sister Buxton uh, had lived for God all of her life, and through the ministry, and now during her her life as a widow. And she wrote this. She says, she says. Brother and Sister Garcia, she says, I have been to many conferences throughout my entire life. And I have never been to a conference like this. Amen. That is. life and in the in the church and been to conferences was our ladies leader of the western district uh, years past so she was she, she's uh, she's not a novice and she knew what she was saying and i really really appreciate those words so so very much what i'm telling you today church is that god has positioned word of flame ministries to do what he wants to do to affect the region and beyond. Amen. I don't he could have used another church, Sister Trish. He could have used somebody else. He could have used a larger one. He could have used a denominal church. But somehow, some way, he reached down and and he looked at us. And I just give God all the praise and all of the glory because I am not worthy at all to to be able to be hosting a conference that is affecting so many people. Last year we had close to 1,500 people coming. Our children's church, or Spanish, or our, our, our uh, and and the main conference, and everyone that attended. Next year we we have to. We are presently looking for a small conference room or a mega church that will be able to host it at least anywhere from 15 to 2,500 people. Amen. we rather have a mega church. Why? Because at a, at a church, it's kind of just plug and play, right? They, they got screens already. They got sound up already. And all we got to do is just get in there and plug and play. Amen. And, and uh, so we are looking. For, I mean, we started looking about a month ago. And, and uh, because we're thinking of what God wants to do next year. Uh, are you hearing me today? Amen. So, so tonight we're going to pass out some envelopes, and we're not going to take an offering for Exodus right now. Okay, but it's a pam yeah, it's a pamphlet. It's a pamphlet. Go ahead and pass them out, please. It's a pamphlet with a letter in it from uh, uh, myself and my wife, also an envelope and and a, a card, a, a bookmark, uh, and and uh, we want you just to look look pray. Pray about it, okay? Because we do not want you to do anything that God don't want you to do. Okay? Did you hear me? I don't want you to do anything that God does not ask you to do. Because when he asks you to do something and you do it, that's where the blessing is. 
the obedience in what he asked you to do. That's where the blessing and the multiplication comes from. Amen. So I want you to pray. And, and July 1st is when we will be we will be pledging, making monthly pledges, weekly pledges, whatever you feel comfortable doing. And, and, and this will be our seed uh, money for Exodus 2022. And everyone said amen. Amen. I'm excited about it. I, I, I'm, I'm so uh, thrilled that, that we're going to be a part of it. Again, uh, God has, has opened up doors. I, I really believe God is o opening up doors. And I want you to pray with me. Can, can you pray with me? Can you pray for your pastor? Amen. Pray with me that the Lord would direct your pastor and pastoral staff to get the right place for Exodus. Amen. That the doors would be open. We'll be able to secure it. Amen. So that the kingdom of God may be blessed. So that the kingdom, the kingdom, it's not about just us four and no more. It, this is about the kingdom of God. We are coming to a close. If you haven't read the latest newspaper, open up your Bibles to Matthew 24, and there it is. You will read the latest headlines in Matthew 24. Amen. And, and that, that chapter talks about the end times. It talks about what is going on in our world right now. Amen. And so we want to uh, know that know where we are. And we want to know the time that we are in. We are living in desperate times. We need desperate people that want to do desperate things with desperate prayer. Are you following me here today? Amen. Because it's prayer that moves the hand of God. It's the only language that he hears. It's prayer. It's the language that he understands. Amen. And so, so we want you to be a part of it. Amen. And again, we don't want you to do anything that God does not want you to do. Amen. Let's, let's stand and let's begin to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now, God, that you, Lord, would touch each and every one of our hearts, our mind, our soul, and our spirit. I pray, God, that you would speak to us, God, and, and let us know what you want, God. You know our coming in and you know our going out. You know everything about us, Lord. You know our hearts and you know our spirit. And I pray, God, that you would allow the power, the grace of the Holy Ghost to have its way, God, in each and every one. Father, I pray for your blessings upon each and every individual in the house, God. Those that you, that you are speaking to, Lord, we know, God, that your word is true. And Father, we thank you, God, to be a part of such a great thing that you are doing in this end time. And you're using us for your glory. To you be all the honor, God, and to you be all the glory. Would you clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise? Hallelujah. You may be seated. For the honor and glory of God, I would like to, to sing a special song unto the Lord. And uh, this song talks about the love of Jesus, the passion of Jesus his um, heartbeat for the down and out, the outcast. The Lord had such mercy for people that, that were down and out, people that were forgotten by society, people that were heartbroken, that were sick, in 
incurable diseases. He went to Calvary for all of that. And it's no different today. I'm sure as well as myself, we can think of somebody right now that may be in Skid Row, someone that may be homeless, someone that may be laid up in a hospital and dying of, of AIDS or cancer or some incurable disease, or someone going through a withdrawal, someone trying to get away from the demons of alcohol. Those are the ones that God came to save and to set free and and such were some of us, amen. But thank God for his blood. Thank God that we sit here today redeemed. But we can't forget about those that are out there. We can't forget the ones that are being tormented day and night by past sins or past defeat. Just didn't go right in their life. And this song talks about it. It talks about a loving God that is still reaching out, but... He's reaching out through you. He's reaching out through me. He wants us to be his mouthpiece. He wants us to be his hands. He wants us to be his feet. He wants us to feel his heart. You know, anytime I hear a siren, my husband's a, a witness to this. If I hear a siren, I said, God, in Jesus' name, wherever that siren is going, I don't care if it's the fire department, the, the ambulance, the police officer, whoever it is, I said, God, you know the situation. Be there, go there, God. And I believe that is what God wants us to do. Many times I've heard that siren when I was, had a husband that was lost. Many times I heard that siren when I had a son that was lost. I had a prodigal that was lost. Every time I heard that siren, it, it, it would bring me to my knees and say, God, don't let it be so and so and don't let it be so and so and reach out. And I just believe that that God wants us to have that burden. And um, why am I saying all this? Well, you just heard your pastor about Exodus Conference. You know, when we came here back in 1997, we packed all our belongings, brought our two young sons to start a work of God by faith. By faith because God asked us to do it. God asked us, and because I knew the background that my husband had come from, and because I still at that time had a father that was possessed by the demons of alcohol, I said, I'll go, Lord, I'll go. You see, many times as a child, I'd sing this song, because I, I memorized the lyrics, and I had a pianist to play. But it never hit me until I started living what God was actually seeing. So as I sing this song today, it's for the glory of God. And I don't know where Jennifer went, but Jennifer, it's for you.
wherever you are, wherever you go, you can be that night for God. You can open up your mouth and you can give a word of encouragement. You can put your arm around the down and out and say, can I pray with you? Can I give you a verse in the word of God? Can I invite you to come to a friendship group? Can I buy you something to eat? Can I talk to you? I know your mind's busy right now talking to voices, but can I talk to you? It really has. Amen. I, I believe I believe there's been like four to five house purchases. House purchases, okay? I knew a day where I, where I was the only one that had a, owned a house in this church, but between last year and to now, there's been at least five house purchases. Amen. And not only that, some people have moved into new places. Amen. New, new, bigger places, houses, apartments, or whatever. And you have been blessed. Amen. And 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 uh, I don't believe that anybody in this church was suffering because of the pandemic. Amen. And not even the businesses that we have in the church. Amen. God blessed our businesses. So we don't live on God's economy. I mean, not, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. We don't live on man's economy. We don't, we don't, we don't wait for the stimulus checks. Amen. I hear what I'm talking about. Amen. God is what, God is the one that provides for his people. He is our Jehovah Jireh. He is our Jehovah Jireh. Amen. And I, and I know a, a, a lot of you, Again, I'm, I'm attaching this to Exodus because many of you have given, you've given unselfishly, and and God doesn't forget that. You cannot God outgive God? You just cannot. Amen. Amen. Yesterday we had Brother Costa with us, and if you were here during our workshop and you heard him speak, uh, you heard some things that 
that uh, you probably never understood or heard before and on, on how uh, things work and, and how to even save money when you are filing taxes and that sort and that kind of thing. Uh, it, it amazed me. Somebody texted me, said, Pat, one of the few, there's only so many uh, tax, what do you call them? The cost of senior advisors? Tax senior advisors that can actually go in the tax court. There's only so many in, in the U.S. that can do that. Well, he's one of them. Amen. And, and that's not easy to get. Not just anybody can get there. Uh, you have to have a whole lot of experience. And he has, he has, uh, he has a doctorate. Amen. And, and, uh, and he is a CPA. And he has done, as far as the secular work, he has done books for, for, for uh, J.P. Morgan, for uh, Texaco, and the list goes on and on and on. Amen. I, I was like, boy, because that is a pretty impressive uh, bio. Uh, but but uh, on top of that, he pastored for 20 years. Amen. So I'm not bringing a novice to this pulpit as well. Amen. He is a man. We have never actually met each other uh, and until he came down on Friday night. But in the last couple of days, we've been around each other eating and 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 talking and discussing stuff. And, uh, I have found myself uh, fond of this man of God. Amen. And, and I believe that he is is a man of principle and a man that will deliver the word of the Lord to this church. And somebody said, Amen. Amen. Without any further delay, with the cost, I want you to come. Take your liberty in Jesus' name. Amen. tonight. It's uh, still late afternoon, I think, for you. It is three hours later for me, so I'm not sure what time it is, to be honest with you, but I am pleased to be here. I There's so many things I could say, and of course, this is my first opportunity to minister in this pulpit and to this church. And that's not a privilege that I take lightly. And there's so many things that I could say, but I really want to get into the Word of God lest I wear out the saints. You know, the Bible says in the book of Daniel that there's a fellow by the name of the Antichrist. And one of the things he does is he wears out the saints of the Most High God. So I, I don't want to have any similarities with him, amen? So I don't want to wear you out tonight, and yet I recognize that you've never heard me preach. Some of you probably presume that a tax accountant cannot preach. Uh, I will let you decide that. Uh, later, I hope you will just hear with an open mind and an open heart. When I come to church. I've been ordained in the United Pentecostal Church for roughly 35 years, pastored several churches over a period of 20 years, and I've been evangelizing for the past almost two decades. So I did it backwards. I didn't evangelize looking for a church. I built churches and grew churches and then said, now I'm qualified to go preach to someone else's church. Saying, so I, I didn't want to mess you up. Amen. <laughs> I want to leave you just a tad better. Amen. Than I found you. I want to leave you at least as good. Amen. And so I so very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. And if I keep talking, we're not going to get to our assignment. But I do want to say for those of you that have never heard my ministry before, my ministry is radically different. 
in the sense that I presume that your good pastor and this good church has taught you the fundamentals of what it takes to be saved, Acts 2.38 salvation, the completeness of the Godhead that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I believe in a sacred and holy life from an ever increasing lost and wicked world and it is not my business to preach that in this pulpit because that is exclusively a pastoral domain. So I'm going to presume that you know what it takes to get to heaven. I'm going to presume that you know something about the nature, the indivisible nature of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to jump into pastoral issues that it is not my place to do because I am not your pastor. You say, well, what does that leave? Amen. It leaves a lot, actually. Tonight is the first night of a, uh, a mini revival that you have called open. And so with the help of the Lord, I want to preach to you on this subject tonight. Tear it open. Tear it open. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 1. I love Genesis because it is Genesis. It is the, it is the beginning of all things. I can find everything I believe in the book of Genesis. You say, Brother Costa, you can't find salvation of water and spirit in Genesis. And when darkness was upon the face of the deep, the Spirit of God moved on the waters and it brought light to where there was darkness. And purpose to where there was void. Amen. I want you to know I can find the new birth in Genesis chapter 1. Amen. So I want to read from Genesis chapter 1 a little bit later than the verses I read to you. For those of you in the video booth, I apologize for not getting this to you earlier. But I'm going to read Genesis chapter 1, verses 10, 12, 18, 21, and 25. And then I'm going to go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. So if you would turn in Genesis 1, we're going to begin in verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he the sea. And God saw that it was good. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after its kind. And God saw that it was, verse 18, to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was, verse 21, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was, verse 25, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was, verses 6 and 7, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was, it wasn't good. Something that God made, he did not declare to be good. The best thing he could say about it was it was so. 
and I'd like to tell you why tonight. Look at your neighbor, say, tear it up. Look at the neighbor on the other side, say, tear it open. Amen. We've already prayed, we've already praised. Jesus, anoint my lips and my heart and my mind as your word is already anointed. Let me speak a word that will lift us from the shadows of our week and let us sit in heavenly places. By your spirit, I rebuke every spirit of depression and oppression, every spirit and hindrance right now in the name of Jesus and I loose the spirit of liberty which is the spirit of God come on somebody tear it open with your praise right now hallelujah open your mouth and give God a praise in this house You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Everything else was good. But when God got to the firmament in between, he simply said, it was so. Now for you to understand where I'm going, I need to establish a couple principles tonight. And if you will track with me as I lay them out and make my case, I promise I will go as quickly as I can and uh, respect... Uh, the time that you invest in this message. There is a difference between something that is made and something that is created. Something that is made is made from something that exists. This pulpit is made from wood. It is made from paint and varnish. Something that exists, made, came together to make this pulpit. But something that is created is created from nothing. Your body was made. The Bible says it was made out of the dust of the earth that God had already created. You are of the earth earthy. But that is not all that there is to you. The Bible says the inside of this earthen vessel is a treasure. The Bible says that inside this earthen vessel is a spirit that was made in the likeness and the image of its creator. Your God is a spirit being and you are a spirit being. Your God is not a body. Your God is a spirit and you are made in his likeness and in his image. God created your spirit from nothing. Before your body was here, your spirit was with God. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. And he made a body. And he put you in a body. But you are not a body. You are a spirit. How do I know that you are a spirit? Because your God is a spirit. And you were made in his likeness. And in his image, Adam was made to be a spiritual man. Amen. But when he ate of the fruit, when he sinned, he stepped out of the spirit and into the flesh. The word carnal doesn't necessarily just mean sinful. It means pertaining to the flesh. Why is that a problem? How do we know this? Because Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. The garden was 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. And Adam walked them every morning with God. I don't know about you, but it is impossible for a normal human body to cover that distance. God is walking with man in spirit. But man eats of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, I've put all the trees in the garden for you to eat, for your nourishment, for your benefit. And isn't it just like the devil? 
to ignore everything that God offers us and to get our attention on the one thing that God said don't touch. Because that tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God knew that if we ate of it, that we would be carnal. And in our carnal state, we would be trying to judge between good and evil. And he knew that we could never judge accurately. We were going to justify our sin while criticizing someone else's sin because we were in a carnal state. So God said, don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Don't eat it. Don't fool with it. And when man, here's how I know, that man stepped out of the spirit and into the flesh. Because when man ate of the fruit of the tree, he hid himself. And you ask, you, you ask yourself, why did he hide? He hid himself because he knew that he was naked. Now he's focused on the body. Here's the thing. He was naked yesterday, but he was in the spirit, so he wasn't focused on the flesh. But now that he has stepped out of the spirit and into the flesh, all he can see is the things of the flesh. Amen. I'm going somewhere. Amen. So the Bible says that you are a spirit that is in a body. God used your parents to give you a body. But you are a spirit being. Don't get it twisted. Your focus is not to be on the things of the body. It is to be on the things of the spirit. My second point. Tonight is that when God wants something, he doesn't speak to what he wants. He speaks to what is holding what he wants. And he commands it to let it go. When God wanted fish and whales, he did not speak to the fish and the whales. He spoke to the water and he said, bring forth. And let it go. He tells the earth. He does not speak to the grass, the herbs, or the trees. But he speaks to the ground. And he says, bring forth and let it go. He doesn't speak to the birds or the beasts or the fish. He speaks to what is holding them. He speaks to the air and he says, bring forth and let it go. And all of a sudden, there were birds. When he got ready to make you, and I hope you understand the scripture so I don't have to take the time to cover it. There is no way that a Jewish writer would believe in a plural God. So when he used the word us, it was speaking of the infinite attributes of a singular God. And when God got ready to make you, he didn't go to anything outside himself. He said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. He made your body, but in the spirit he was holding you in himself. The Hebrew says he catabonied. In other words, he literally brought you forth out of himself. And I know this because he breathed into a body the breath of life. What was in him came into us. Can somebody say amen? It's important that you understand this because you can tell where something is from by where it goes when it dies. Because it goes back. A tree that dies in the forest goes back to the earth. 
When a fish dies, it goes back to the sea. When you die, your body goes back to the earth because the Bible says from dust thou art and dust thou shalt return. But if you are a regenerated spirit by the power of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says that's not all. It says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord because that's where you came from. third point the things you need are invisible the things you really need are invisible but they are real the Bible talks about peace joy love talks about it in the Holy Ghost amen they are in a realm that cannot be touched my promises my blessings are in a heavenly realm. The problem is I've got to figure out how to get my blessing out of a heavenly realm into the natural realm. I've got to figure out how to get my invisible blessing to manifest itself. You say, Brother Costa, this is, this is uh, not what I expected. Good. My Bible tells me that God shall supply all my need according to his riches, which are where? They are in glory. If you want God's riches, let me tell you where they are. They're in glory. If that's not enough, let me give you another proof. Paul said he hath blessed me with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So I say to you again, the things that you really need are invisible. Now here is the problem. I can't pay bills with a blessing that's invisible. What's, what's, your, uh, what's your utility around here? Cal Energy or something like that? Edison, okay? I can't call up Edison and say I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that I've got the money to pay you. The bad news is that you can't see it. Because Edison is going to say, well, now you can't see either, and they shut you off. Amen. Amen. Your blessing is in a spiritual dimension. What you really need is in heavenly places. So you've got to do what your God does, and you've got to speak to what is holding your blessing and say, let it go. Bring it forth and let it go. Can somebody say amen? Before something is released in the spirit, the right sound has to be made. Because your God is not just a spirit, he is a speaking spirit. The first thing we learn about God is, and God said. Amen. He is a speaking spirit. When there was no one to say amen for God in the beginning, he is still speaking. When there is no one to hear him, he is speaking because he's showing us that you create your environment. You command a blessing. You release a blessing by speaking. Everything in the world follows sound. Everything in the world follows the sound that it makes. You never find anything going in a different direction than the sound it makes. Let me just take a little pause here, a little detour, and say that's why we speak in tongues. The Bible says it's a sound from heaven. Paul said it's an angelic language. 
in the book of 1 Corinthians. When you speak in tongues, you are speaking in the direction that you are going. Don't speak about your trouble. Don't speak about the hell that is all around you. Don't speak about your problem. Make a noise in a heavenly direction. Do you know that everything that has power makes noise? Everything that has power makes noise. Tomorrow morning when I climb aboard that jet engine, I know that it's got power. And I know that it makes noise because the airport workers that are loading my baggage and working around the plane are going to wear noise-canceling headphones. Because those jet engines make a lot of noise. Because they have a lot of power. If you are around anybody that is firing a gun, I don't mean in a criminal activity. I mean at a shooting range or whatever. You are going to be to wear headsets. Because the bigger the caliber of a gun, the more noise that it makes. In the military, they wear hearing protection because the more, the bigger the millimeter of a cannon or artillery, the more sound that it makes. The problem with the church, and I'm not preaching to this church with this comment, but the problem with the church universally is because we, is that we have become too quiet. The enemy does not hear our sound, and so he knows we lack power. If you don't like the direction that your life... Track with me tonight. People who are depressed make a depressing sound. They listen to depressing music, and their life follows that sound. People that are angry make an angry sound. Sometimes that's not enough. They practice sign language too. Amen. I'll let you figure that one out. People that are angry make an angry sound. And their life follows that sound. But David said in Psalms 89 and 15, Blessed are they that do know thee. Joyful sound. It's not just any sound. The indicates a definite article. Blessed are they that know the joyful sound. The sound that's supposed to be in the church is not weeping and wailing. It's a joyful sound of victory. A sound that will make the demons run and make the heavens shake. Come on, somebody. A sound that will release your blessing. Somebody give them a praise in this house. Everything that has life makes a sound. The bird has a song. The dog has a bark. When you were born, the doctor turned you sunny side up. And slapped you on your hinder parts and you made a sound to let everybody know that you were alive. There has to be a sound in the church that shakes hell to the core and it says, turn loose of my blessing, turn loose of my mantle, turn loose of my family, turn loose of my finances. Come on, somebody. There's an African saying that when the lion roars, even the dogs stop barking. I know a real live safari hunter. And uh, he tells me that when the lion roars, everything in the jungle stops and is silent. Because when the lion roars, what he is saying is, if you can hear my roar, 
you are in my territory. And I can get to you. Everything stops in its tracks. Even the crickets stop rubbing their legs together and making that chirping sound. A lion's roar can be heard from a long way. And he is saying, if you can hear me, I have authority over this territory. You don't have to see me. If if you can just hear me, I can get to you. You are made in the image of your creator. And every so often, there needs to be a sound that comes out of your spirit that says to the enemy, if you can hear my praise, then you are in my territory and I can get to you. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. They cannot withstand the church. Last point before I get to my text. Sound always precedes manifestation. In other words, you hear a sound and manifestation is coming. Bless my brother. Before you see a tornado, you hear the sound of a train. And if that train is too loud, then you are too late. Amen. I've been in Wichita, Kansas, preaching for Brother Cornwell when there was tornadoes all around. I'm in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and if it sounds like a small town, it is. And I've been there when 10 tornadoes touched down at the same time. Amen. I, I, I've seen some tornadoes. And if you hear them, it's probably too late because right behind that sound is going to come the tornado. That's why God told Jehoshaphat, send the praisers first because when you make sound, manifestation is going to follow your praise. Some people wait until they see something to give God a praise. And that's why they get upset. And that's why they become discouraged. Because they're waiting for manifestation. That they don't. But if you make the right sound, manifestation will come. Somebody give them a praise right now. Did it, ever, did it ever strike you as odd that they said, who shall we send? And the man of God said, send Judah first. Why did they send Judah? What did Judah do? Judah was the tribe that was associated with praise. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word Judah means praise. It's not just a name. It means praise. They said, who shall go before us? They said, send praise. They said, who shall go first? Send praise. Walk around the walls of Jericho. See just how big your problem is. See just how intimidating your your enemy is. And then give God a praise. And watch the walls fall. Watch the manifestation come. In a time of famine and drought, three years to be exact, the prophet looked at a sky, almost a cloudless sky, and he said, I hear the sound of abundance. Abundance has a sound. And if you hear something, it means that something is on the way because sound precedes manifestation. Now you say, Brother Costa, you've been preaching or teaching or whatever you want to call it. I honestly don't know the difference except for volume. Amen. You've been preaching or teaching for, I don't know, maybe the last half hour, 
And you say, you never told us out there. It is good. It is good. It is very good. But then it is so. Well, actually, I've explained the whole concept to you. So now that you know the concept, let me fill in the blanks. There are three heavens that we know for sure because of the scripture. We know that there are three heavens. You say, Brother Costa, how do you know there are three heavens? Because in the book of Acts, Jesus was caught up in the clouds and the angel said, why stand ye here gazing into the heavens? So the atmosphere above our head, the clouds, is the first heavens. I know there's a third heavens because in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul said, I knew a man whether in the body or out of the body, I know not. I believe Paul was talking about himself personally, but you can believe what you want to believe. But he said this man was caught up into the third heavens where the throne room of God is, where all God's goodness, where God's rulership, where God's holy angels are. So the first heaven is the atmosphere above my head. The third heaven is where God dwells. But in between is a second heaven. If there's a first heaven and there's a third heaven, then it makes sense that in between the two is a second heaven. But the Bible never, ever, ever calls it heaven. It says, and God separated the, the first heaven up and separated it. He, he pulled up the third heaven and separated it from the first heaven and the space in between, which should have been called heaven number two. God said he separated the two heavens, the two firmaments, and that space in between, God simply said, it is so. Why did God say, why was the best thing that God could say about the firmament in between, why did he say it was so? Because God knew who was going to dwell there. Everything received God's blessing except the firmament in the middle. He could not bless it because he knew the enemy was going to dwell there. You say, Brother Costa, I thought the enemy was in hell. Not yet. Hell is not a place that you come in and out of. Hell is a place that when you go there, you stay there. The Bible says that hell is reserved for the devil and his angels. That means they got a permanent seat, but they haven't taken it yet. It's just a reserve seat. God has reserved it for the devil and his angels. You say, where, where is the devil? Where are the angels now? The Bible says that he is the prince of the power of the angels. Air in Ephesians 2 and 2, he is in the air. He is in the firmament in between. I know it's popular to say, you know, that the devil is in hell. It's popular to say, devil, I, I rebuke you and send you back to the pit from whence you came. He didn't come from the pit yet. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 12, that until that time, 
We have to deal with principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness that is where? It is in high places. Of the power of the air. He doesn't dwell in the third heaven. That's where God's throne room is. He doesn't dwell in the atmosphere above your head. He dwells in the firmament. So God blessed everything he created. But when it came to the firmament, he simply said it is so. My blessings, my riches in glory where my needs are supplied, is in the third heaven. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray this way. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Do you know that every version of the Bible up until the 1920s didn't say on earth? It was changed. The, King, the authorized King James 1621 or whatever it was, version of the Bible says, in earth. You were made out of the dust of the earth. You are of the earth earthy. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you are literally praying thy kingdom come from heaven and be done in me. Thy will come from heaven and be done in me. Let me be a portal of your goodness. Let me open up heaven into the earth and let it spill out. Can someone say amen? I am here, but my blessings are in the third heaven. And between them is a firmament. So I've got to find a way to get my blessing from the third heaven to manifestation on earth. For the Costa, this is sounding awfully strange. For those of you that need chapter and verse, let me take you to the book of Daniel chapter 10 where Daniel teaches us something. Daniel is praying. And the Bible says on the first day he prayed, God sent with the answer. Amen. But it, when it got to the firmament that was in between, it met an evil spirit by the name of the prince of Persia. And it did battle with the prince of Persia in the firmament in between for 21 days, three weeks. God set the answer on the first day, but it didn't come on the first day. Didn't come on the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, the seventh day. The angel shows up and says, Daniel, God has heard and answered your prayer. But between me and thee was the enemy that is in the air. And he said it was only your persistent prayer that got me through. Now, how does that work? There are things you've been praying for. There are blessings with your name on it that have already been released in the heavenlies, but they're being held up in the firmament. And God is waiting for you to make a sound that doesn't talk to what you need, but it speaks to what is holding it and says, bring it forth and let it go. There is a sound. There is a sound. The Bible says, can I take it just a, a little deeper for a minute or two more? I promise I'm almost done. In the Bible, we find there's a praise that stills the enemy. There's another praise that binds the enemy. There is another praise that silences an enemy. 
But in the Bible, there is a praise called the shout. And the Greek word means to split, as in to split the ears or to tear. Everywhere you see the word shout, the literal translation means to tear open. But the translators didn't know what to do with that. So they simply said, shout. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Tear it open with the voice of triumph. It's not the same as clapping. It's not the same as waving your hands. It's not the same as dancing. And I think you ought to do all of them. But the Bible says there is a shout. Everything that has power makes a sound. Everything follows the sound that it makes. When you want something, you don't speak to that something. You speak to what is holding what it wants. There is a shout that comes out of the church that goes up into the heavens and it has the power to tear. The power to tear open the firmament and allow the blessing that God has already released to come from the third heavens and to pass through and manifest in an earthly realm to manifest in your life we wonder where our blessing is we wonder where our miracle is God has already released it in glory what you need is already in glory but Jesus said whatsoever things you desire when you pray believe that you receive them and you shall have them we recognize that God has already heard my prayer and released my blessing but there's warfare over my head trying to block it from getting to me therefore will I shout until it tears open the heavens and my blessing manifests here when I shout the enemy up it tears a hole in the firmament and my blessing comes forth but we shout at the wrong, wrong time and we are silent at the wrong time we get still when we need a miracle but when we need a miracle we're supposed to shout so that it can get through give you this last story and then I'll get out of the way a preacher friend of mine in the state of Nevada his brother was the head of entertainment for the state of Nevada and that means that his brother ultimately was in charge of all the shows that were played in both Las Vegas and Reno. Illustrated sermons, and he said to his brother, Can you get me a lion tamer? And in the middle of his message, at the appointed time, a side door opened. True story. The lion tamer came in with the lion on a leash. And that lion slowly walked across the platform. At each and every person on the floor. It's back to the audience. It pivoted and looked up and examined the balcony and examined everyone in that church. Only then did it set down. Or 
or a new environment. In the book of Revelations, chapter 5 and verse 5, I believe it is, my Bible tells me that there's coming a day where the lion of the tribe of... He's not just a lion to anybody, but to those that know how to praise him. He's more than a house cat. And my Bible says, having put all of his enemies under his feet, that Christ will forever sit down. He is the lion of those that know how to praise him. We are made in his image and his likeness. Therefore, we can roar until our blood be your feet. Raise your hands to heaven and shout. Tear a hole in the atmosphere. Tear heaven open with your praise. Tear it open right now. Let your blessing come forth. Come on, somebody. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Having put all enemies under his feet. I, I, Pastor, I, I, I want to get out of the way, but I feel we're on the cusp of a breakthrough. But we're, we're not just quite there yet. There, we, we, we need a, just a maybe a little push, if you will. I didn't intend to say this, but maybe it will help somebody. In the book of Isaiah, the Bible says, in the year that King Uzziah died, there's a message right there all by itself. But he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Do you know what that means? When an ancient king would defeat the armies of another king, the king would ride into battle with his armies. And on his robe, on the back of his robe, on a cape, was the symbol of his kingdom, his royal crest. It symbolized his power and his authority. And when a king was defeated in battle, the victorious king would cut off that cape. And when they got back to his kingdom, he would have the royal seamstresses sew that defeated king symbol under the emblem of his kingdom, showing that he was both greater and had defeated that kingdom. My Bible says when Christ has defeated all of his enemies, Isaiah said, when I saw the Lord, he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple because all of his enemies are defeated. I want someone to know tonight that cancer is defeated. Come on, somebody. Give God a praise. Give God a shout in this house. All manner of sickness and disease is defeated. Our enemies are defeated. Lack is defeated. Depression is defeated. Oppression is defeated. All you have to do is shout and tear heaven open. Somebody give him a praise in this house. Our Father, all of heaven wrote your name. Sing louder. Let this place be up with praise. Can you hear us? The sound of heaven touching us. Oh, the 
Child 